It is part of the saga of Western man. It is a different kind of war than we've ever fought. Even the weapons are new. Only the names of the fighting units are old. The 7th Cavalry, the 8th Cavalry, the 5th, the 12th, and the 9th. Regiments born and forged in the Indian Wars and now riding to battle through the skies. It is a different type of country than we've ever fought in. Now flat and sodden with rice paddies now rolling with hills and meadows, now mountainous and steep. It is hot, it is humid, it is thick with plants and vines. It is largely unpopulated and in the military sense it belongs to no one. Not to the Viet Cong who roam it, not to the South Vietnamese. It is no man's land. In Vietnam today, you hold only the ground you stand upon. Some 250 miles northeast of Saigon, in the valley of the Song Ba River, is Ang Khe, the 1st Cavalry Division's base camp. It is an entrenched fort, ground solidly held even if under constant enemy probe. It looks much like any other army installation. For even if this is a different sort of war, the army's business has not changed. The battle still belongs to the infantryman and his rifle. The Army's basic unit is still the Rifle Company. 170 men molded into one team under the command of a captain. One such is A Company, 1st Battalion, 8th Cavalry. Today there are replacements from the States come to fill the open files left by casualties, malaria, and end of enlistment. Most of these men are volunteers. Almost 80% of them are regular army. Many of them are thinking of making the army their life's work. They come from all over America. Their commander is Captain Theodore Danielson, a career officer, West Point class of 60, married. It is his second tour in Vietnam. He already has two bronze stars and has been cited for a third. He's responsible for the well-being of his men, their readiness for battle, their disposition in combat, and their lives. Good morning, man. Good morning, sir. All right, first of all, welcome to A Company. My name is Captain Theodore Danielson. Tickle to death to have you all in A Company. It's the best company in this uh, battalion, the best battalion in this division. Now, in basic training, you heard of tactics like objectives uh, that had a definite terrain objective. But when you're fighting the insurgents, your objective is the enemy. Consequently, the operations have names like search and destroy, search and clear, seize and hold, seize and search. We've got to find the enemy before we can do battle with him. Now, each of you is going to be paired up with an individual that's been in the company for a while, an individual that knows the ropes. He knows when he shoots, he rolls over, especially at night, or moves his position so that when that joker shoots back at you, at the flash, there won't be anything there for him to hit. In general, somebody that knows the ropes. I don't suggest buying. Shaving lotion, shaving cream, or any of this good smelling stuff because a VC can smell it. When you're out there at night, try to get soap that doesn't smell at all and use that to shave with and wash with because they can sure smell it. And I'd like for all of you to write your mothers or your wives, tell them you got here, you got here safely, you're here, you're in a good unit, you've been well taken care of, et cetera, because you will be. You take care of your men by 
making them ready to face whatever they have to face. You give them a weapon, make sure it's properly sighted in. You train them in advanced techniques, not included in their basic training or their advanced training. We call this repelling. It's a way to get down fast in an area where a helicopter cannot land. Go! Sometimes the unforeseen happens, but it's unusual. Once the men had repel, though, they're a lot more confident in themselves. In repelling, a man can reach the ground from 60 feet in about four seconds. And if somebody's shooting at him, I guarantee you he'll try to make it faster. You train him to climb up a helicopter, hovering 20 to 50 feet off the ground, because sometimes they're gonna have to do it. They carry their full gear because when they have to do it, this is what they'll have to carry up the helicopter. In this exercise, a man learns all there is to know about the pull of gravity. You make them jump because yours is an airborne unit, and this means a company of paratroopers. Although they come to you basically qualified, they still have to be proficient and maintain proficiency because every time you jump, it's a different story. You teach all these things and more as thoroughly as you know how and as fast as you can. Because you know that thorough training is the key to survival on the battlefield. And then, one day you're not training anymore. You've got a combat mission. Company A conducts an air mobile assault to search and clear a area that we've had uh, numerous red haze or infrared sightings. To sweep along a defined axis, which I'll show you, to push enemy into position rope. I want every machete well sharpened because we are going to need them. And I do mean need them because it is thick. And if you go out there with a dull machete, you go wear a man out. Ammunition. We will carry two grenades per man, period. If we need more, we'll get them. First place, it's really too thick in there to use them. The big weapon in this fight's gonna be the M16 rifle and the artillery. We'll carry one mortar, 40 rounds of ammunition. And make sure that each platoon has a lot of very colored smoke. It's so thick in there, it's the only way we're gonna be able to tell where we are. Canteens will be full, and water purification tablets will be carried. We will have artillery in front of us and on our flanks. So, we've got it when we need it. Always the same, that old Charlie is out there. If and or when we get hit, all I want to hear is hitting back. We'll hit him back with five times as much as he hit you. From now on, speed is a tactical factor. Speed is critical to the success of the mission. Get out there where aerial reconnaissance has spotted the Viet Cong and probably a supply dump. Get out there before they have the chance to move away. 
Already the rocket ships and the artillery are preparing the landing zone. They will stop firing when these helicopters are ready to land. The Viet Cong will not stay pinned to one place long once they know they have been spotted. In this war, speed is the greatest potential. From the moment the ships are airborne, the company commander bears the ultimate responsibility of his men. On his decision, his nerve, his coolness and his judgment rest life and death. Charlie. Down there, but where? Company A has fought him a dozen times. They've taken Viet Cong prisoners, they've found them dead with weapons in their hands, but they've almost never seen them actually fighting. This time, Charlie's waiting on the landing zone. I'm down on corral. I've got contact with some snipers. Over. Everybody, get off the middle of this LZ. Everybody, move out. Get out there. Four six. Get that mortar set up on the hill. I won't fire in one minute. Get them moving. Back up. Second platoon, three o'clock, they're on the other hill. Camino, I want artillery on that hill, and I want it now. Hurry up. Get over there, come on. Okay, that's it. They're bugging out now. We're going after them. Now the Viet Cong have pulled back. A company is an infantry company on the ground and in pursuit. Jamaica, I want you to take your platoon and cross the river and secure the river crossing site. Give me a smoke screen. This is Anvil 30 coordinates 405285. Asthma 3200. Fine, we'll adjust, over. SR16 mark coordinates 6, the smoke's beautiful, we're in the process of crossing, receiving sporadic sniper fire, over.
pursuit of an unseen enemy. It is a frustration. Climb, cut, slash, and never know whether the distance between is becoming shorter. In this jungle, it is all but impossible to tell where one is. More sniper fire. Come on, first, come on, let's go. Let's go, Sergeant Scott. All in behind, we might have something up there. Just keep going up the top of the hill, pull up behind two six, maybe. Come on, Sergeant Havard, you're overdue. Come on. If y'all move out up there to get up on the top, go ahead. Let the second platoon handle it if they can. Take a deep breath. The Viet Cong have moved out. They abandoned their base camp. First platoon, get some security around this place. The Viet Cong operate out of these way stations. Without them, they have no base of supply in no man's land. They raid from here, they return here to rest and refit. Artillery shells, probably intended as landmines. These are American manufacture, perhaps captured in Korea. Sergeant Fowler, if that rice is wet, spread it out on the ground. Otherwise, burn it. Then we'll burn the camp. This is left guard six. We pursued the enemy into a company sized base camp. Base camp has been destroyed, negative friendly casualties. I'm going to move and establish a base for the night, over. It is not a fulsome victory. There's little glory attached to it. There is the satisfaction of a mission accomplished and the knowledge that this band of Viet Cong will never operate out of this base camp again. How many Viet Cong base camps are there in South Vietnam? If one knew the answer to that, one might hazard to predict the eventual end of the war. It's been a long day, but in terms of this war, a good day. We suffered no casualties, we took our chances, we made no mistakes. Most important, we accomplished our mission. This is what victory is. Some people tend to misunderstand victory. This is what victory is in Vietnam. Knocking out Charlie's bases, chasing him off, killing him when he'll stand and fight, keeping him off balance until he quits. Other wars had other kinds of victory, but this is a war we've got. Tomorrow, tomorrow we get to do it all over again.
Next morning, A Company moves out again. The mission is still pursuit of the Viet Cong, but now what started as a battalion action has grown to a brigade-sized sweep. This company is operating as part of a vast strategic plan. But in this terrain, to all intents and purposes, it is on its own. If you look out here to the front, you see the top, you see this near the middle hill there, and then you see a little low hill below the horizon. Got it? Okay, come down that little trail. And you'll see a ridge line. And then it drops off to another ridge line. That place that we're going, uh, where they receive the sniper fire, etc., is right there between those two near ones. Stu is going to sweep through it. You're going to cover him. But watch your rear. Drop one squad to the rear and you'll have a box. Right in there. You'll search it. Yesterday they hacked through the jungle. Now the meadows are open, wide, and perhaps even more treacherous. Two platoons spread out abreast. They cover about a 400-yard front. They must stay in contact. If they break contact, the enemy, if he is there, can slip through. No one knows if he's there. One must assume he is. Two six, this is six. Slow down. You're breaking contact with one six. Out. This is six. You're still going too fast. Over. This is six. I don't want to have to come up there and show you all how fast to go. Out. Occasionally, the company halts while scouts move ahead. Each man takes advantage of the breather in his own way. The city council met last week. The vote was five to three. Burn the hometown depot down and build a factory. You take that stretch of history and wipe it off the map. Take old engine number nine and burn it into scrap. Blue water, blue water, blue water line. If you can't afford a quarter, then you ought to give a dime. If everybody gave, then we could save. The blue water line. Okay, let's go. woods close in, the underbrush clogs and stifles. Now the company advances on only a 30-yard front. Each man stays within sight of the next one. In some places, that means within inches. They watch the trees for grenades and snipers, the ground for punji sticks. Punji stakes can go through a man's boot. The filth into which they're dipped can give a man gangrene within hours. A booby trap. Either the Viet Cong have been here, or they're close by. The lead platoon has made contact with the Viet Cong. Left guard, four six. This is left guard, six, over. 
Left guard six. Get those mortars set up. Five, three, two, hundred. Over. This is left guard six. Over. Now this is six. Very good. I just heard it pop over my head. Six, keep at it. This is the catch. They don't look like much, but they stayed there and fought until the remainder of their group had run away and they were surrounded. Perhaps they'll talk. Viet Cong seem to feel that once they've finished the fight, there's no reason to keep quiet. Now this is left guard six. Enemy resistance eliminated. I have six having captured, three of which are wounded. Two friendly WIA. Get better back up there. I want to get these boys out now. Over. That's guard six out. Now the company is ordered back to base camp. There is too much undergrowth and too many stumps for the Chinooks to land. The company will have to be lifted out. They call this Camp Ankei, but to almost 16,000 First Cavalry Division soldiers, it is home. Their only home in Vietnam. It is the dispenser of such extravagant luxuries as hot food, hot showers, a change of clothes. It is the chance to rest up, clean up, and take the turn guarding the camp perimeter. Almost every night, the Viet Cong probe some part of the camp defenses. There never has been a full-sized attack, but one never knows when a probe can develop into an assault. The defenses ring the whole camp more than 100 yards deep, surrounding an area one-third the size of Manhattan. They defend the most complex, sophisticated fighting unit ever used in war. 478 helicopters, planes, a supply system for parts so vast it must be serviced by a computer. The 1st Cavalry Division employs more specialized skills than any unit in the history of war. And every day the weapons are cleaned. A little because of discipline, a great deal more out of regard for the primary tool. There is little else to do. Three miles away is the town of Antuck. Population indefinite but growing. Situation prosperous, amenities limited. It is the soldier's only alternative to camp. It is also his only contact with the Vietnamese. This part of Vietnam is virtually unpopulated. There's a hospital in Antuck, a joint Vietnamese-American effort. It is largely supported by the men of the 1st Cavalry Division who donated the equipment and supplies. Pneumonia. There's a small permanent medical staff. Come on. 
This is a distribution of clothing to children. It grew out of the soldiers' letters home to the effect that these youngsters had few clothes for either living or sleeping. The people at home joined in filling this want as they thought the want should be filled. The flannel pajamas may not be practical in a subtropical climate, but the children don't really care. Whatever it is the soldier does in Nantucket lasts only a couple of hours, in no case ever beyond dark. Nightfall finds him back in Anke, his fortified and beleaguered home. There will be no passes today. A Company is spearheading a convoy moving west along Highway 19 towards Pleiku, another large army base. Highway 19 is normally under Viet Cong control. It is A Company's job to get the convoy through. Four six, this is six, over. Left guard six, occupy your hill and register. Prado, out. Three six, this is six. Let me know when you have Zulu secure. Out. The company moves by bounds. One part holds, the other moves ahead. At each bound, the mortars are ranged in. Sure they dig good holes. Yes, sir. So right around the bend there, let's see the road takes a little road to the left, then it goes straight, and then it uh It sounded a bit actually sorry, what it, the firing sounded like it's slow motors along just just around this little curve, that first little curve right here. That's where it sounded like it's coming from. Well, if I get shot at, release a squad to come tooling over there here. Hello. Yeah. You send a, how about me send a couple of rappers on my teacher? Okay, mount them up there on the front there. One of you jump on the back here, one of you jump up on the hood. Boy, you might need more ammunition than you got in that gun. A civilian truck is ambushed up ahead. It could be a tramp. It could be a roadblock. The Viet Cong might be waiting past the curve or off the road or even at the truck. There's only one way to find out. Go and see. up that way. Left guard one zero, left guard six, over. Left guard six, let me speak to three six, over. A left guard six, inform left half six that I have uh, moved to the coordination point and pass a coordination point. That's my location now if something happens, over. Six, and if anything happens, rest assured, I'll give you a fast call out. Let's pick up these civilians, get them some medical aid. Uh, Eta. 
À. Bác sĩ. À, băng giùm tôi hả? No, tôi à. có bác sĩ. À, bác sĩ hả? Dạ. Yeah. À. À. Các ông đi với tôi. À. À, bác sĩ phê chưa? À. Ok. Mayor of VC. Huh? Mayor. Okay, I'm going to go to Tamiya. Tamiya? Yeah. 8 o'clock. That's a shoot you heard. It ambushes the truck. No sign of the Viet Cong. They ambushed the truck and then disappeared. Now A Company has secured its sector of Highway 19. It will now prepare defensive positions to hold the highway until the convoy moves through. Other troops move ahead of them to clear the next stretch of road. This is one bridge and I secured. Have a good trip. It will be a long night on Highway 19, but tomorrow there will be something else. In Vietnam, there always is. And then it is the time to remember. Every now and then, a commander in the army runs into somebody that's an ideal soldier. He exhibits this, whether he's a PFC, a spec four, or an acting sergeant. Acting Sergeant James E. Thompson was one of these people. When I took over the command of A Company, Thompson was the guy that got his people up in the morning got them moving when they were sloughing off a little bit, and in general, helped his fire team leader make his fire team one of the best in the company. He was a born leader. People liked to do what he told them to do. And if he were here today, I can guarantee you, staying in the Army, he would have been one of the finest soldiers the Army ever produced. Those of you who didn't know Lieutenant Tweedy, this was his first assignment in the Army. The first cab division, Air Mobile. He joined us just before we departed the States to come over here. He was a brand new second lieutenant. He came over here and he led his platoon in the best manner possible. To give you an insight into his character, I got a call on the radio after we'd been down about uh, 10 minutes. He said, there's somebody lying on the LZ. This was after he had reached the safety of the creek bed. He further said, I don't know who he is. I don't know whether he's dead, but I'm going out to see. He picked up out of the safety of the creek bed, ran about 100 yards over to the individual, laid down beside him. He was not dead. He talked to him about 10 seconds. Then the individual, whether he was afraid, I don't know, he got up and he ran off the LZ into the creek bed so he could go on to accomplish his mission. Then Lieutenant Tweedy got up, went back, picked up his platoon, maneuvered him into the final coordination line in front of his hill. About halfway there, he was killed. In honor of the dead, let us stand.
Quitty, Stewart, K, 2nd Lieutenant Infantry, A Company. Thompson, James E, Acting Sergeant, A Company. Brooks, Jimmy L, Staff Sergeant E6, Bravo Company. Flags, James E, Private, Bravo Company. Masterson, Edmund M, PFC, Bravo Company. McCallop, Williams, PFC, Bravo Company. Swanson, Neil W, PFC. Cannons boom, a fire of interdiction, or the artillery preparation for a new assault. A Company 1st Battalion, 8th Cavalry, marches off again. One company and one company commander in an army composed of companies, and they all are pretty much alike. They man the outposts, and with their lives, they buy the peace we shall enjoy tonight. City Council met last week. The vote was five to three. Burn the hometown depot down and build a factory to take that stretch of history and wipe it off the map. To take old engine number nine and burn it into scrap. Blue water, blue water. Blue water line. If you can't afford a quarter, then you ought to give a time. If everybody gave, then we could save the blue water line. Okay, let's go. 